I was honored when John um, asked me to moderate a panel as a newly crowned CEO, and the first word of this panel was, is print dead? And I said, <laughs> John, could we upgrade a little bit? So he changed the title. But I'm thrilled and honored to be here, and to my left, I'm going to introduce to you some of the most amazing and accomplished professionals within the, what I would call the platform of content. And really, we're here today to talk about um, readership. This is not about print. Let's make that clear, OK? So I've got the authorities to my left. First, I'm going to introduce Meredith Levion. Rhymes with my client, Evian, right? Very <laughs> thrilled. She is the EVP of advertising for the New York Times, and I'm a paid subscriber, and we're going to talk about that. Next in line, and this is really, I love this, he's a pinch hitter, and quite honestly, I consider it an upgrade from the post, so when you go back, please tell Jesse that. <laughs> but Brad Feldman, um, Brad is vice president and head of Post Solutions. Studios. Studios, I'm sorry, studios, right? We are in Hollywood. Um, so welcome. Larry, a legend, right? The publisher <laughs> of all New York properties, media properties, correct? Correct. But the diamond in the darling of your portfolio, New York Magazine, which I'm a paid subscriber. And then finally, 22 years, a princess of People Magazine <laughs> and the People brand, right? Karen Kovas. I've known Karen. I was this big, and I was doing reaching frequencies by hand <laughs> over 40 years ago when People Magazine was launched. So. I am thrilled to be here finally controlling the conversation with all of you. I love it. OK. So before we actually get going, right, before we actually get going into some of the content, um, I did a little homework on all of you to make sure that we grounded the audience and why we have these fine individuals sitting up here today. So um, Meredith, um, you are a Virginia Cavalier. Very active in your AC. sorority, so a natural AC born leader. Champions. That's right, ACC champions, and you're going to play my Spartans, so you got it on, girl, right? And, and for a moment, um, Brad, you're a, a Georgia Bulldog. Go dogs. You had a tough year. It was a tough year. Tough year, we're, we're okay. Back, um, Larry, you're HWS, um, Bart the Statesman, and your Herons <clears throat> from Hobart and William Smith Colleges. You're the intellect of the team. <laughs> Absolutely. That's fair. OK. And Karen, a beloved Cornell um, Big Red. OK. So again, they come with qualifications. And um, our Oscar producing technological staff in the back, we have some content to share. So I'm going to hand off the baton to Meredith. She's going to wow you with some content, right? And then we're going to have some discussion, because I got some questions for you, OK? Awesome. So Meredith. I'm, I'm actually going to ask our Oscar producing staff in the back if we have a clicker, which I don't think. No, they do that. We pay them a, a crap they... load of money. They do everything. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God. That's where our dues go, to all this stuff, right here, right I'm now. Just, I'm just going to say clicks. It's true. I love that. So no, I, I have to start oh, by. Um... Oh, wait. Oh, wait. See? He shows up. Look. I thought there was a clicker. I, I guess we don't pay them enough. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we are the second yeah, to last piano. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. Wait till the morning. They're never here. Right. OK. So, so um, somebody said to me this weekend that if the New York Times company were a solar system, our newspaper would be the sun, and everything else we did would be the planet that, planets that orbited around that sun. And in thinking about how to talk about print transformation, I actually stopped him and corrected him and said, it's just not true. Um, at the Times, we think of our journalism as the sun, as kind of the life force of everything we do, and certainly the life force of, of the transformation we've been through, and all the ways that people access that journalism as, as the things that are in orbit. And when we talk about that journalism, let's see if this actually see? works. Look at we that. talk about, I'm clicking it myself, we talk about photographs like this one that was shot by Tyler Hicks, who risked his life to be in that mall in Nairobi when the shooting was, was happening, or the incredible story that David Kirkpatrick wrote um, a year after Benghazi that actually brought clarity to what, what really happened, who attacked our embassy, or this amazing, this one gets me every time, this amazing story written by Luke Mogelson and, and photographed um, by one of our award-winning photographers where they spent three days on a boat with 57 refugees um, who were trying to get asylum in Christmas Island. And on a happier note, when we think about our journalism, 
I always think about everybody in this room probably knows who this is. Bill Cunningham travels all over the world to help unfashionable people like me make sense of, of what trends are. On his bike, right? Are. That's right. That's bicycle. right. And with that, that very famous camera. So when we, when we think about our transformation, we actually think about the journalism as, as the life force in it. And I would say for the last 17 years, our work has really been how do we make that journalism much more accessible to people in every way they'd want to access it? So in social and mobile and digital and print and live events, and I'm happy to say there are sort of two great referendums on the first part of that transformation so far. One is that today there are more people reading the New York Times than at any other point in our history, and that's probably obvious given digital, given mobile, given social. I think that even bigger fact and a huge part about our the huge aspect of our being able to sustain a future is that there are more people like Lori who are paying yeah. for the New York Times today than at any other point in our history. They and don't that, comp. Yeah, they it, don't comp anymore. So don't <laughs> try. You get nothing from them anymore. See, see me if you want to talk about that. But um, so so more people paying and you know just to, to give a, a specific on that, we have almost eight hundred thousand people paying us for a digital subscription a lot of money up from zero two and a half years ago. So a big part of our transformation will be how do we keep finding people who want to pay for some of the great content that I showed you. And over the next few weeks and months, we'll actually launch a whole series of new mobile first journalistic products that we believe will be attractive on a paid basis to new audiences. So that, that's the first part of the transformation. Second part of the transformation at the Times, I think ironically and, and frankly for every media company is about how do you stay relevant in a digital and mobile and social and whatever comes next world. And the, the irony for us is that we stay relevant by doing more of and committing more to the same things we've been doing for 163 years. And the first of those things is by being a, a, a a beacon of truth in the world. And the way we can be that beacon of truth is by committing to staffing a newsroom um, the way it needs to be staffed. So, you know, a, an example of that, before the downturn, we had 11, so six years ago, we had 1,100 people in the newsroom at the Times and 48 bureaus around the world, and we have just as many today. The world kind of relies on the Times for what is truth. The world also relies on the Times for what are the stories that actually matter. So in a world of abundant content, we help people decide what's a story of consequence, and we put stories that might not otherwise be on the map on the map. We did a great package on a very compelling story on homelessness at the end of last year that was hugely read, and it, it really made that a consequential issue in New York City again. And, you know, I, I would say in the world that we live in today, it may not be enough to be a beacon of truth and, and to also be the arbiter of consequence. We also have to be master storytellers. We have to master, you know, what does it take to really engage and immerse people. And two years ago, we took a great leap forward with a, a story called Snowfall that I'm guessing many of you have seen, which yep. was multimedia at its best. And since that time, we've done hundreds of interactive stories. This is our explanation of Ted Ligeti's better slalom than anybody else for New Yorkers in the room. I love this. This is our explanation of how in 12 years the, the landscape of Manhattan changed dramatically under Mayor Bloomberg. And this is actually the last that I'll show you. This is my favorite of the immersive and interactive stories we've done last year. Um, how many people in the room have seen this? So, so this was the dialect quiz, 25 questions that placed where you were from based on what words you use to express things, and remarkable for two reasons, written by an intern, and not just the best read story of 2013, the best read story of all time in the New York Times, so Fabulous. at least in, in modern digital history. And I'll end by saying it isn't just, um, our transformation isn't just about how do we transform journalism and storytelling, how do we do it for marketers? So at the beginning of the year, we launched a product called Paid Posts, which allows marketers to tell stories on our platform. This is an, an example of United showing how they pack a plane of athletes and equipment going to the Olympics. And I'd be remiss if I didn't show you one final thing, which is invention and innovation in print storytelling. The best watched, most attended to print ad we ran all year was a big innovation that after 163 years we figured out that for a movie called The Book Thief, we could run two blank pages, and that got more attention Fabulous. than anything else we did. Fabulous. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to do a handoff. Right, Brad? Okay. <clears throat> so there's nothing like the headline of the New York Post, correct? 
We live by it. We dictate our social conversation by it. And the gap actually <coughs> filled out of the pink sweaters that President Obama was featured in last week. So, you know, let's talk about the power of the post. Let, let's talk about the power of the post. As I, as I said to these guys earlier, we are the original 140 characters. <laughs> we, we are the pioneers of real time. Right? In, in many ways, if you think of the headlines, telling a, telling a story in 140 characters in, in bold, addictive content, that's what we've been doing. We've been telling stories for 213 years. And you're wondering who that gentleman is there. That's Alexander Hamilton, who actually founded The Post. You know, I would say over time, I think everybody sort of smiles when you mention The Post, and it's true. We have a very unique voice that we've honed and developed over the years. And, you know, every day in our newsroom, we get up and we think, how can we tell the most addictive stories, the ones that make you smile, the ones that you're gonna share, the ones that you're gonna you know, pass along to your friends? And when we think about transformation, what we thought is, okay, there's a magic behind what we do. There's a magic to our newsroom. And how can we actually allow marketers and advertisers to tap into the magic of what we do behind that? And so what we did is we created Post Studios, which is the team I head up, which is, there's a lot of words on here, but it's, it's a team of writers, designers, creators, who at the very heart of it is allowing brands to tell stories the way that we do. And it's allowing brands to tap into the magic behind what's our newsroom. And there's a number of things that we do around this, and I'm, I'm gonna focus on a few of them, but certainly there's sponsor content, certainly there's white label content. Um, but I wanna talk about what we have is the um, two things, which is the, the real-time newsroom, right? <laughs> Probably some of your <laughs> headlines you've seen here. You know, I, I, I think I sat at a panel earlier where people debating, is it a newsroom, is it a war room? Well, if it's a real-time newsroom, <laughs> guess what? We are a newsroom. Every day we're getting up and we're telling the stories. So what we're really doing is productizing our newsroom. You know, we, 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 our DNA is built in agile news production, right? We know how to tell a story in a few words. So what we're doing for brands now is we're actually setting up real-time newsrooms in a number of different ways. Um, one is certainly around major uh, events and moments. You want to have that Oreo moment. Guess what? We're up telling the story and, and reporting on the Super Bowl or the Oscars, Oscars or the Emmys. Um, we're also actually creating newsrooms for brands around specific topics. So if you want to you know, do social listening and, and have reporting actually around a specific topic, we will actually assign a managing editor. Um, we will actually allow you to tap into our headline writers. So if you want us to man your social feeds during the big moment, we're actually productizing and taking our newsroom. So when you talk about transformation, this is really the future of our business. We're allowing, we're allowing brands for the first time ever to tap into the magic of what we do. And here's an example. We didn't actually run this, but the, the, the Super Bowl there, you see the, the, the idea of marrying real-time <coughs> content with ads. There's the story on the Super Bowl. And you can see how a hair care brand might have used this. It's okay, Jersey loves a good blowout. Um, certainly very much in the pool's voice. And that's, that's what we're willing to do for brands. So it's really, you talk about transformation, you talk about revolutionizing what we do. Uh, we really think that this is sort of the future of our business and it's almost every conversation that we're having. Uh, the other piece that I want to talk about is what we call Post Studios Originals. And this is very story-driven, uh, original concepts that well, we're partnering with select brands on to, to tell great stories and to tell stories that are certainly rooted in New York but can go national. The first program I want to talk about is something called Blockumentaries, which is a series of, series of short films that tell the stories of great city blocks and how just in a few blocks, basically our, sto our story of America and the story of our lives and culture can unfold from Tim Pan Alley to 42nd and Broadway, to Wall Street. Um, again, it's rooted in story. We're going back into our archives to look at some of the original <coughs> stories that were told and telling these stories together with, with brands. So this has gotten great response out in the marketplace and really transforming our business as well. And then, really, this is my last slide. Another program that we have is called One More Night. And you know, if I, I happen to be a music fanatic. I don't know how, how many there are in the room, but if you think <laughs> about music, uh, especially in New York City, there's these amazing venues in the 60s and 70s that really helped define music and really helped define culture, places like Max's Kansas City and CBGB and Danceteria that unfortunately are now defunct. Uh, what One More Night does is actually resurrects now defunct legendary music venues for One More Night and has modern day bands paying tribute to the bands that made those venues famous. But it's not just that, it's not just a concert, it's a story of what these venues meant and how they're part of the, the rich fabric of our city and our culture. And again, it's talking to roadies, bartenders, musicians, people were there, that were there and telling the story of these places and going into our archives and leaning on, on our journalists and leaning on, on you know, the institution that, that we provide uh, you know, as journalists and, and, and as storytellers. So that's just a quick snapshot of, of some of the things that we're doing that we really feel are transforming um, what we're doing. All right, hold on for a second, Brad. Okay, yes. Meredith. 
Okay, <clears throat> question for both of you, right? Sure. You've been very innovative in finding new ways to monetize your business model. But I still want <laughs> to talk about the epicenter of your audience, okay? So I have the New York Post from this morning, <laughs> right? It is your classic <coughs> tabloid, and I love this because it is, you know, as I call it, journalistic. And then I got my friendly New York Times, a little different in, okay? But I want to talk a little bit about what the two of you are doing in paper stock, right? And this is the Sunday style section. This is why I subscribed to the New York Times, because I believe that between these two, and you have your own option, um, Brad, that this is one of the new channels and one of the new avenues for your industry. So before I hop over into um, what I would call the magazine currency, right? Can you talk a little bit about what you have up your sleeve? And neither one of you talked about mobile. You got a few minutes because I gotta, I've got to show the love, right? So can you, can you yeah. take it from there? Um, quickly, on this, Sunday Styles, this was a huge investment for the time. So it's basically printed on much more beautiful, whiter paper than the rest of the paper. And the ads look amazing. The photography looks amazing. The stories look amazing. We're continuing to look for places for where should the print reading experience be enriched. We've done that with T Magazine over the last year with Deborah Needleman coming on as editor, and we are looking for how do we keep doing that in other places. We actually, you know, everybody talks in digital about running out of inventory. We actually think about our Sunday style section as a place where right. we're running out of inventory. So we're still investing in things like paper, and we're talking about doing that in Sunday Magazine as well. On um, mobile, just real quick, on a big news day, more than half of our traffic comes to us from a mobile device. So we, you know, we always say it took 150 years for the newspaper business to contract. It has taken the desktop arguably one tenth of that time, right. and we envision a future where it might be, you know, very, very rich print experiences and mobile. Brad, uh, start off. Build off of that mobile. Same with us. About uh, over 50% of the traffic is coming in through mobile. So we're working on what new offerings look like in both uh, the mobile web and, and uh, tablet. Um, as far as you know, introducing new sections like that, we do have Alexa, which is I don't know if you guys have seen that, but it's, it's our style uh, broadsheet um, that is focused on fashion. Uh, we're we're talking about expanding that out into other categories such as travel right. and luxury. But you know, we want to stay very authentic to who we are. And you're still going to see a oh, lot of Oh, you've got your like authenticity this. in there. Yeah, Trust me, exactly. you do. Okay. <laughs> so now let's do a handoff, Larry. Okay. Uh, and I, one thing about Larry, name a publishing company. He has been a publisher of a major platform and a major title. He left for a while, took a rest, and then came back how many years ago to join New York Media? 11 years ago. 11 years ago. So awesome. look, at, I love this because it has been kind of a resurrection of, um, I call intelligence and just, you know, the, the, the commitment to the space. And so let's talk a little bit about the fact that we have literally New York represented here from the Times to the Post to New York Magazine. All three of you represent a different currency in New York society, kind of the epicenter of the world. So can we talk a little bit about your 400,000 loyal readers? Sure, and I have to say, I took this transformation thing really literally. So I'm gonna tell you about the transformation of New York from a magazine whose business model basically had its circulation concentrated in a tri-state area to a national print and digital powerhouse. <clears throat> magazine has always been available in major markets, but sometimes it was kind of hard to get there. It was popular and influential way beyond New York. Out here in LA, we would hear these stories about uh, studio heads having the magazine read to them over the phone <laughs> on Monday so they could make sure that they didn't miss anything. But um, you know, the internet and the launch of NewYorkMag.com changed all of that. Besides our inherent belief that the web was going to amplify our small regional magazine, we set out to make our site a different product from the magazine. We also had an advantage lots of other print media did not, which was pent up demand. Audiences outside of New York wanted access to what we had, and we were not exchanging Print, read print readers for digital ones, we were adding an entire new audience to whom our content suddenly became readily available and all those studio heads had to do was log on. There we go. 
a strong and growing audience. The result of our early adoption of the web shows a brand with an audience that's now 10 times larger <laughs> than what it was 10 years ago. The magazine circulation is the thin red line at the bottom, and it's still a thin red line, but it's gyroscopic in its strength, and the web audience continues to grow every year. But the real transformation is that what was once a magazine with a circulation of 400,000 is a brand with an audience of nearly 20 million. So do you all this to yourself, or, or how did you do this? Oh, how do we do this? I'm getting yeah, to that. They want to know the story of <laughs> um, how yeah, you I, did I, I, I promised the whole story within five minutes. Right, well, we have 11 minutes, 11 seconds, so. Okay, it was social and search. Social and search. Social and so search. So where are my, my, uh, my model builders, right? That's it, we don't, we don't need any silly models, right? It works. It works, hold on, I'll keep going. There's keep the tri-state area where our little magazine circulated, and then there's the US where, uh, you, like I said, you can log on from wherever you are. Here are the pie charts. With the enormous growth of the audience came a significant shift in how the market thought of us. We created two very separate products, but with a unified voice. They were siblings. New York Magazine and NewYorkMag.com were siblings, but they were not identical twins. The magazine was built for consideration. The web was built for speed. And while the magazine has regional strength, the web is a national product. My yin and yang thing there shows that the circulation of the magazine is mostly in the New York area, and the traffic for the site is um, mostly national. Does that correlate to your attack on advertisers? Absolutely, absolutely. <coughs> the magazine has regional strength, but we are now offering this content that was not available suddenly across the country. And here's the fast part of the presentation. Um, we built out all of our areas of vertical strength. We were very big in news and politics, and we launched the Daily Intelligencer. We were very big in fashion, and now we're dominating the online fashion conversation with The Cut. New York Magazine is well known for its restaurants, so we developed Grub Street, which is all about restaurants in New York, restaurants right here at Abbott Kinney and everywhere else. We have an entertainment site because culture and entertainment is one of our strong verticals. Vulture is the fastest growing part of our brand. We like to say it has the mind of a critic and the heart of a fan. In print, we recognize that content consumption rituals are changing and we're changing with them. Here's Alec Baldwin who may be moving here very soon if you <laughs> read this piece. Because he of the post. The because post, of the post, <laughs> they, they, they call it. Are you kidding? He and nope. Hilaria, they can't, they can't even do go good private. It's they, terrible. They call them names. Terrible, the post. They, Don't mention it. It's our, it's our pleasure. They chase them to LA. But the point of our, this is a, the first of our bi-weekly issues, and the bi-weekly was a big move for us, but it recognizes the change in the way people read magazines and the way people get media. Magazine will be 20% larger. The magazine will deliver more of a magazine experience, which is what we consider a premium experience. This particular issue had a magazine within the magazine, and it had a section that was meant to be cut out called The Keeper, and we also took content from our digital site, The Cut, and ran it in print. And we also gave a much richer visual experience. We have special interest titles in areas where we're really strong, weddings and design. And I'm announcing here the development of our new channel called The Science of Us, joining Intel, Grub Street, uh, Vulture, is this new channel based on the enormous success of some of our pop science pieces. This one, we have a recent story called All Joy No Fun about raising kids. Um, you know, is uh, email swallowing your lives? Does money make right. you mean? The science of us is going to be the sweet spot between enlightenment, entertainment, and awesome. Excellent, Larry. Vulture Festival, bringing Vulture to life. May 9th, Webster Hall, MIA, is the opening act. That's it? You didn't nope. even talk about The Matrix. My nope. favorite thing in New York <laughs> Magazine. If you don't read that, it is the currency of social relevancy. Have you read it? It's <clears> fabulous, <throat> right? From despicable, I, I love it. I, it it's, it's amazing, and, and you know, it, it is really something that I think, from an advertising perspective, you're missing a revenue model there. I really believe it, because it can become really kind of a, a virtual population of content. You need to do that. And it's sort of the brand statement for New York. It's amazing. The highbrow, lowbrow, brilliant, despicable. Okay. Uh, the result of all this is that our um, audience has grown 35% in the past year, and it's new products, it's different products, it's a unified voice, in my humble opinion, an irresistible look. Here's what it looks like. Let's see if my animation works. There it goes. 
There it goes. There it goes. See? Now, do you notice that I do not have a physical copy of New York Magazine? One, what publisher comes to a major conference like this without a magazine? Larry. And two, I, I was on the plane and the flight attendant on Delta Airlines based in, in New York flying out of LaGuardia mm -hmm. said, I love that magazine. I give up. I gave, I gave up my title, Larry, and here I sit naked. Nothing to show I, for I'm, a prop. It's terrible. Okay, next year, bring, a, bring a book. Will I'm you? not worthy. Really? <laughs> Look at Bill will buy you. Where's Bill? Bill's got all the money in a jet and the, and the, and the trophy today. He'll buy you a, a, an issue. Okay, now. If anybody has a copy. Now, I'm going to tell you this. See, I, t I tore off my <laughs> subscription <laughs> label down here because people steal my magazine, and I'm not kidding. Um, where's Gail from the ARF? Oh. Gail, where are you? She left. I watched your panel. Where are you? Uh. I am here. <laughs> All right? I'm going to tell you this. This has been 40 years. I remember when I was an assistant media planner at Campbell Ewald, and Lou Schultz, a legend in the business, told me that I could listen. I could listen to the publisher. <laughs> and when publishers came and called on us, we bowed. We absolutely, the world, you know, revolved around publishers. And I mean that today even more, Karen, that I've watched you grow with this brand, survive a multiple you know, iterations of management, editors, et cetera, and you still stand. So what's the secret? And talk a little bit about why you've been so successful in the continued elevation of this brand. Well, I'm the princess of people. Apparently. Well, I mean, you know, so I'm going to change Joe, my business cards to here? that. Our, our new CEO of Time Inc. Well, is Joe here? Is here. Where is he? I, I've been fortunate either? enough to work on this brand for 22 years, and it's really been um, exciting. When I first started, the magazine was in black and white. So when you think about how we tell the story today versus then, I mean, it's it's completely transformed, and that's really you know it's accelerated dramatically. The consumer still loves celebrity. You know, she is fascinated by extraordinary people, and that. Our success has really been, how do we stay true to our DNA, yet transform to meet the consumer's needs? And re we're really working on two facets of that this year. One is investing in the core, and I think you, you've heard that from all of us today. And the second is expanding the footprint where it makes sense. So print is the core of what we do. She lives for that Friday night when she gets this magazine in her mailbox. So everything we're hearing, subscribers are highly satisfied and you know, it still costs over $100 to subscribe to People Magazine. In a world where magazine prices are all over the map, she makes a real investment. So part of our success this year, we think is gonna hinge on celebrating that reading experience. So we too are improving our paper stock. Uh, we're going up to 38 pound. Actually, we, um, in the Oscars issue, but uh, two or three weeks ago, we made the investment. And it's really a big deal. We wanna celebrate that lush, premium reading experience, which she, we, she cares so much about. And everything really, when, you, when we talk a little bit about the transformation here, what we think is uh, ahead for us is based on catering to that paid subscriber and celebrating how we tell a story. And really that paper sock is just at the core of how we're going to continue to do that. Um, but, you know, in thinking about how we develop products now for this paid consumer, you know, we have a thriving digital business. Um, we have pop-up opportunities. We, too, have really explored many ways for consumers to touch the brand. But one thing we did, and we launched it last fall, was really try to reimagine what it means to be a subscriber to people. I mean, when you think about it, you, you pay $100 to get a magazine. But what, if, what, what would it look like if you paid $200? What would you expect from a brand like People? How would you imprint the People DNA across a variety of different products? And we went through that exercise, and we really went from being a one-way conversation, once a year renewal to a magazine, to a tiered, multi-platform opportunity to give the consumer a choice. How did she want to connect with this brand, whether it was print, digital, gift box, experiences, and we built a model that she's so excited about. So now we're talking to her 24-7, and it's really provided also the architecture for us to launch new products, right? So we can really hone in on what is that VIP? What does she care about? And how can we bring the DNA of people to life for her? And I have a couple of examples that I want to take you through, uh, particularly as it relates to the Oscars. So we had our biggest Oscar issue ever on the new paper. It was really in the last 10 years, the biggest day 
the day of the Oscars, the biggest day after the Oscars. So our traditional ways that we touch the consumer are all firing on all cylinders. But what are the other ways that we can tell stories around the Oscars and bring it to life? One way is at that VIP level. What we've done is add experiences into that VIP level. And if you're a people lover, one of the moments you love most is the red carpet. So we ended up bringing um, a couple hundred lucky subscribers to the red carpet. We teamed up with the Academy, and we basically, they gave, we gave them a front row seat on the red carpet of the Oscars. It's pretty unbelievable. I, don't, I can't imagine those subscribers aren't going to renew next time. That is Matthew McConaughey actually coming over and shaking the hands of some of the subscribers. It's a, quite a memorable day just for being a subscriber to people. We provide that unique access. And it's also an opportunity for us to bring marketers along for the ride. So we had the opportunity to bring in CoverGirl, Olay, and Pantene, who were also interested in maybe getting that red carpet look. And they were a part of that Oscar fan experience. So an interesting way for us to really bring the experience of being a people subscriber to life. But you know, we want to talk to the subscribers now every day. So what we've done also is layer on bonus content onto the website. So just for the premium subscribers, we have an area of the website where we provide a variety of different ways where we tell the story. The first one is, you know what, we give them a first look at the cover story. They might get their issue on Friday, but we give them a look at the cover story on Wednesday. We have a product like the Morning Buzz, where every day we update that, giving them a little inside peek at what the editors really care about. So th the benefit to us is that we've, had, we've seen a 70% increase in digital logons from our subscribers, which now we can connect the data. We used to know who the subscribers were, but we didn't know what they were doing digitally. So now we have a point <coughs> at which they want to be a part of our world across all platforms, and this is really driving that conversation. Okay, we have a few more seconds. I, I got really nope. fast questions. John, Ask I need away. two more minutes, please. Two minutes? Two minutes. Okay. Ask I, away. Okay, funny, I have an Instagram book. Right? That was a sales call for Instagram. Talk to me. I'm, I'm just going to throw out some things. Yeah, I want an opinion. Instagram in your world. Awesome. Great. Great. Larry? Te where, it's where we tell the story that doesn't make it into any of these other platforms. Go Competitor Coachella. or cuddler? Cuddle, you're going to cuddle with them or are they gonna, you're going to fight with them? Both. No, cuddler. Cuddle? Cuddle. Cuddle, you're gonna love him, you're gonna love him? Love. Love, 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 okay, where's Peter, he left, with, okay. All right, um, I wanna talk a little bit right now about Google, the world, the universe of Google, and what's the impact of Google, because if you remember, I believe it was early 2000s, they tried print a little bit, I mean, they had it in their mind, okay, so Google. Great for the market, because it pushes, forces us all to move forward faster. Okay. AIDS discovery and innovation. Google's great, but in the particular interest of New York, you know, they're going into the local listings business, which is a big challenge for us, and it makes us rethink, you know, what is our role vis-a-vis -vis local listings, and what does that mean relative to kind of the national profile I was explaining about New York. So okay. it's good, but it forces change. Well, I think it's good, and I think we haven't explored Google Hangouts enough. I actually think there's an opportunity there for subscribers to reach out and touch our editors in a unique way. So hey, John Nicoletti's good. here, Mr. Service of Google. You should talk to him, right? A couple more things. You had a great story in the New York Times about the retail version of marketing called The Story. Are you familiar with this and your opinion for you as a brand? My opinion? Very good. Are you familiar? No, no. Okay. Retail outlet put in your brand and it changes over, same physical space, right? Could the Post do it? Uh, it Maybe in a very specific part of town. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Larry? We find certain retail uh, outlets are really strong and others are just terrible. Okay. So it's a mix. And Karen, you, you really haven't, I mean, your brand is very controlled and very kind of contained. So what do you think about taking it into what I would call the masses? in a different approach, like a pop-up people store. Oh, absolutely. I mean, okay. we could go red carpet, right? We could go nostalgia. There's a whole host of ways that we okay. could bring celebrity One last life. question, John, one last question. Okay, I say post office, you say? Still use it. I say post office. Actually, don't really use it. <laughs> Trucks. For you two, yeah. I say post office, and you say what? I say that we have a program that delivers our magazine with the New York Times in doorman buildings in New York City, and it's a big success. Collaboration. Wait till we tell Dana about this one. Monkeys can do it. Okay, yeah. 
<laughs> Karen? We're in. We're, we're, in. we're in. Okay, so look, a year from now, um, Bill, you'll, you'll be up on, uh, here on stage as, as the king, and <laughs> I would like to continue the dialogue on this very, very interesting platform for us as marketers and advertisers, and most importantly, as readers, as, as we started the panel. So thank you, Meredith. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Princess Karen. And um, we're one panel away from free booze. So thank you, right? Yeah.